Well, good evening, everybody. We're here at Glimpses once again. Thank you for coming out. And uh, we are talking with Laurie Wilson, who's running for Susun City Council tonight. Thank you. So, well, Laurie, give us a, about two minutes of who you are and why you're running. Okay, well, my name's Laurie Wilson, as we've stated already, and um, I am a mother of um, two wonderful children. Well, I guess they're not children anymore. They're teenagers and um, a wife of, of my husband, Shavars. He's a military guy, and um, we've known each other since the seventh grade, and I consider him my best friend. And um, that's, you know, just my kind of family makeup. But the reason why I'm running is because I am passionate about Sassoon, and I'm passionate about the issues of Sassoon. I came to Sassoon um, about, uh, well, I moved to Sassoon almost 10 years ago and um, came to the area about 14 years ago to Travis and met a lovely family in Sassoon and very soon after arriving and spent a great deal of time in Sassoon. So when my husband decided to go from active duty to reserves, we moved to Sassoon and loved the community, loved how beautiful um, the city was and just enjoyed it and decided to you know live there but then over time people especially when the foreclosure crisis happened people started my friends started leaving and I was why you know I was puzzled by that because we were just a, a tight-knit community and um, most of them had children about the same age as mine and younger and they were leaving because um, they did everything outside of the city they shopped outside of the city um, their children participated in programs outside of the city. They worked outside of the city, and they said, "Why should I live in the city? Why should I don't? Why should I stay in this house that I'm upside down on um, when I'm leaving the city for everything?" And it got me started thinking about the city and what was happening in my city, and not realizing that my city was changing, and that if it continued on that path, then people would stop choosing to live in Sassoon. And so that's really what got me involved. I started looking at things at a, at a deeper level, and I realized my kids were about to become teenagers or early teens, and there was not much for them to do. If you were five and under, you had a lot of things to do in the city. But if you were in elementary or, or, or high school, you didn't. And I kind of feel like the teenagers are a um, uh, set the tone of the city. If the, like how a mother, if she's happy, the house is happy. If she's sad, the house is sad. And I feel like teens, if they're happy, the city is happy. If the teens are sad or you know don't have things to do, then the, the city can be terrorized in a sense or hold hostage to the emotions of um, teenagers. And so I felt like that was a really important issue. So part of why I was running was because of the teen issues. And then I started to look at our financial issues. And that's my background. That's my strong point. And um, I, I just didn't like what I was seeing as far as we were continuing to run a structural deficit. And um, I was continuing seeing some of our officials brag about no layoffs and no um, uh, service reductions, which wasn't entirely true. But that's not how you run a household. If you are running a structural deficit, you should cut somewhere. You should, if I, when, when, when I was unemployed, we cut things out and we had to, we were forced to. And, it, and I felt like there wasn't someone at council level, um, to my, you know, um, what I wanted to see, who was making those tough decisions saying, okay, we're going to have to cut somewhere and looking at where we can cut that would satisfy not just the short term growth of a lower budget, but also long term to make sure that people were still choosing our city. So that's about where I True. went. True. Awesome. Good. Well, we've got a few questions for you. Okay. And uh, soon has a population of over 28,000 people. Right. Can you effectively represent most of them, if not all of them? And uh, would breaking down so soon into district representation serve the people better? Um, I think you can effectively represent as a whole. I think Sassoon is too small to be broken down in districts because when you look at, I thought about that at one point, when you look at the different pockets, maybe it could be better represented by a particular person, um, a particular person from a neighborhood and those issues because as I've walked Sassoon, I've seen that each neighborhood has its own issues, but at the same time, if you always have, take it for example, um, besides the mayor, there's no one on the council that represents financial, um, has a finance background, you know, and um, in my particular area, there's another person on the council who is lives in my area, so 
I wouldn't be able to run. And I have, I think, the experience and the skills needed for the council at this time. And technically, I would not be able to run right now um, based on this person living in my neighborhood. And so uh, for another two years, um, Sassoon would not be able to get uh, the support that they, I feel they need and that I would bring. So I think that, you know, when you look at a, such a small city, I think it's more about what are the skill sets on the council, not necessarily what neighborhood they come from, because I think we deal with the same um, same issues at the core. And I think as a council member, you're made to look at the city as a whole. Our council has uh, primarily focused on the waterfront. I don't think they've had a balanced view, and that's something that I want to bring, a balanced focus to all of Sassoon, to both sides. The waterfront, because we need to revitalize it. It's, you know, um, we don't have the businesses that we need to be able to support economic growth there. And then also looking at what are we doing in our neighborhoods. And so um, I think there needs to be that balanced focus. And I think myself, I know what the skills that I have because I'm finance, finance, finance. I mean, that's what I do. I look at budgets. <laughs> um, but I also have a community sense. I have a passion for our community. And I think that's the type of people you need on the council that have a passion for the community so they can meet all the residents, but also um, have a certain skill set that they can bring so we can have a diverse council. So I understand they're going to break ground for Sassoon, uh, for uh, Walmart. Walmart, yes. Yes. How do you feel about that? <sighs> Walmart. <laughs> Walmart is definitely a complicated issue. I generally, um, I generally don't like Walmart. I think when it comes into communities, it tends to suck up local businesses, and um, so I gener I mean, you know, that's my general disposition. However. Sassoon needs the revenue, and it's already on the way. Like you said, they're about to, they're going to be breaking ground um, before the end of the year or maybe the first part of 2013. And so um, since they're coming, silver lining is it will help with the budget in two years at the earliest. Um, it will help in our 14-15 uh, budget. And so that's the silver lining for me for Walmart. And I admit I'm a principled woman. Um, I don't currently shop at Walmart, and um, but I do and I try to shop local whenever possible. So in two years, I'll have a um, decision to make <laughs> about whether I will shop at Walmart or shop uh, local. I mean... Are you a person who buys American goods? Yes, I do. Is that primarily well, prim why you I, I primarily try to. Mm -hmm. I think for me with Walmart is a couple of things. Um, I think, like I said, what they do to the businesses in the area. And, and here's the deal. People want inexpensive goods, you know, so people go there. And, and I think, you know, I have relatives who've worked for Walmart. I have a relative um, who's close to me who's worked quite a bit long there. And, and the way that they, um, their employment practices, I don't really care for. And so that's at one point I did. I used to shop there. And then at one point I decided it's not worth it to me because of the issues that I've seen on the back end side. And so that's why, um, that's part of why I don't now. And I think we need, but I do think we need to support our local economy wherever, whenever possible. You know, so soon, I think, I can't remember the figure right now, but it's a, 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 over 70% of our tax revenue leaves the city. People shop in Fairfield and Vacaville over our area, more than our area. And so if we had a place for them to shop, because like I said, I had friends leaving. You know, if you wanted school supplies, if you want school supplies, you, there's no place to get it in Sassoon. You know, and that's a big deal for families. Over 50, about 52% of our families, our households in Sassoon have children under the age of 18. So all of those parents, every time school time leaves, and they say, now, well, we have a Dollar Tree. I'm not getting my goods at Dollar Tree for my, I'm not getting a pencil or paper for my children at Dollar Tree, you know, so really you have to leave the city. And that's, that's, I think that's important that, you know, we have those types of businesses, well, not those types, that we have businesses. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just soon, probably, I wouldn't want it to be Walmart, but, you know, silver lining, it'll bring in tax revenue. There are two council spots open mm -hmm. and three candidates. Yes. You and two incumbents, if you get voted in, who should get the other spot and why? Oh my, that is a really good one. That is a hard one for me <laughs> because, um, uh, you know, I, I know everyone on the current council and I respect them all and um, they're very different. The two are very, very different. So I have different reasons for, okay, well, 
if it's this person, I, we would have this. If it's this person, we would have that. So, I, you know, that's a hard question for me because they're, they're just... They're just so different. I just want to come in first. <laughs> That's, I just want to come in first. They can battle over second. And I mean, either one, I, I, you know, I know I can work with them. I can work with anybody and, and my life has proven that. I'm a collaborator. I bring people together and great things happen. And I can show over the course of my life how that does. When I go into a place, I make it better because that's my purpose, I feel, is that if I can't make it better, then I need to not be there and I'm willing to not be there. So I think no matter who it is, you know, I will be able to work with them and make sure that Sassoon is great because that's the only reason why I'm running. I want it to be a better place. Is it possible to achieve a successful campaign without private or public union support? Um, without private or public union, I think. I think what they were saying there's private as in corporations. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think so in our current climate. I, like I, um, you know, just a little history is I ran two years ago. And it was definitely a family affair. Is my husband um, and my two children. We were knocking on doors together, shaking signs on the corner, you know, that kind of thing. And um, it was difficult. I was out raised by quite a bit of money. And so I didn't have the things needed to get the message out there. And so I think it's hard. Um, you know, this time I've been more successful in raising funds from, you know, individual donors. Um, because I ran before, people had a much more vested interest in saying, okay, you could do it this time because I lost by 300, a little over 300 votes last time. So I had more individuals saying, okay, I want to help champion this cause for you. Um, but the money that I've received from various organizations, whether it's my local restaurant or, you know, a union has definitely helped. And I still have to raise additional money to be able to finish strong. So I think in our climate, it's hard because, you know, back in the day, you just walked and knocked on doors and people answered the door. You know, now when we go out and walk, um, we only get about 50 percent, about 50 percent answering their door. And then um, so then that's 50 percent of people that you just are completely missing, you know, so because people don't like to answer the doors anymore and rightfully so and so soon we have a burglary problem right now where people are ringing doorbells and waiting for people not to answer and you know and breaking in and so um i just think it's hard there's so many competing messages right now you have your tv i mean you can't even think of commercials because you know i have tivo or, or i have a well i used to have tivo's what is it now? But anyway, I fast forward through commercials. So, you know, it's, it's just hard to reach people and it takes a lot of money to kind of break through our technology and break through the other messages out there. So I think it's hard. Um, I think it's doable because I've known people to be successful at it, but, um, well, not that many, a few, but. How do you feel about, um, because many people who get in become politicians. How do mm -hmm. you stop yourself becoming a politician and still st uh, still remain a, can uh, a representative. Right. I, for me, um, and when you said politicians, I kind of grimaced because I, you know, it's something that I've thought about, especially this time around. Um, the first time it was definitely, like I said, a family affair, and it was much easier to stay um, true to my core. And uh, this time it's been harder, still been able to stay true, but it's been harder because there's so many competing interests involved. Um, I think the best way, though, it really is to, um, or the best way for me is to remain authentic. And when I feel myself going against what I know I, to do, then I definitely stop. I have a wonderful husband who's known me since the seventh grade and <laughs> is quick <laughs> if he sees me, you know, at the, I'm, after a meeting, he'll say, hey, wait a minute, what was this? Or why were you doing this? Or, you know, that kind of thing. Because above all, he has an interest in, you know, uh, keeping our family together and keeping, you know, um, what we're doing from a pure place. And the other thing, um, gosh, there was another thought I wanted to say, but... Basically, I think it's a matter of just staying true. And oh, here's what I want to say. Um, following what you're passionate about. Right now, I'm passionate about the things of Sassoon. When that passion wanes, I expect to not be doing council issues. I mean, staying at the council level. And I think sometimes we get career politicians and they've lost the passion of what got them involved in the first place. And now it becomes 
this job thing and not listening to the people. And so for me, you know, um, I'm passionate about the things that of Sassoon. And as long as I have that passion, I will keep working hard for Sassoon. But once that goes, you know, I follow my passion. So once that goes, it's okay. All right, well, where is my passion? And then head on to that. And I think you that's become how you governor then. <laughs> well, if I, I don't plan to become go I'm not a, I don't, I never expected to have a career in politics and do that. Um, I can't imagine myself going to that level. Um, and the only way I would is if my passion went to state issues, you know, but right now my passion is at Sassoon, <laughs> so that's where I'm at. Uh, was there a particular event that, that it was a catalyst for you to begin this? An event? Um, Which I think you covered somewhat with the people leaving. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's really what it was, is what made me shift my focus um, from just my own life to looking out what's happening in my city and 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 I want to see it different. Um, one thing though that sparked my passion for Sassoon was our Independence Day celebration event actually. That was my first introduction to Sassoon. Um, we were a new family to Travis and I, my little one, um, she was my little one, she's taller than me now, my 14 year old, almost 14 year old was um, just a baby and we went to the 4th of July Independence Day celebration on the waterfront and it was a time when they didn't even have good grass there it wasn't didn't look like it looked now and we were sitting there and so many people came and were just like hi and everybody was so friendly and that's when I really fell in love with the city and really started spending most of my time there so I think that was probably because I grew up in another city and didn't ha don't have those feelings for that city and so that was my first time of having like this um, natural affinity so to speak to my city where I and I hadn't yet lived there but was connected to it in this um, interesting way and I think that's really what started it because even if I saw people leaving I might have been like them bye <laughs> you know what I mean let's go too. let's get a better house you know we live in an old house that needs repairs I might have been okay well let's go get a better house but there was this connection that was made the very first time and my very first time was the Independence Day celebration and that's why it was important for me that we you know save that event. Uh, what are your thoughts on Sassoon's redevelopment program and the current situation that all redevelopment districts are in? Are done right? Yeah they've been disbanded. Um, I think that uh, the redevelopment program was wonderful when it was first initiated in Sassoon. You know, when you look back 30 years ago, Sassoon was the worst place to live in the East Bay. I mean, they were actually did a survey and they were voted that. I mean, it was the worst place and that's what it was known for. It was a pretty high crime rate um, as far as drugs are concerned and nobody wanted to live in Sassoon and nobody wanted to say that they did live there, you know. Um, but the redevelopment program helped turn so soon to what it is in today and, and I think that it was effective in the beginning but I think over the years we saw that it wasn't because I've lived in Sassoon almost 10 years from now 10 years now and there hasn't been much change in 10 years I mean when I think about how much money we've had in redevelopment and yet you don't see um, the results of that in the last 10 years when you compare 25 years to now you see it but not the last 10 years and we've only not had it for two years and so that says well what were we doing for eight years when we had it or what were we doing for the four years when there was still a good economy of the last you know 10 so I don't think it's um, quite a, as effective as it could be in Sassoon which is like a flagship for it and I know that other cities have abused it and um, so I don't think it was a good program. I wish though um, that Governor Brown, instead of just completely bottling it out, I mean taking it out, had had some type of real transition and a, a plan to how um, to help cities transition um, from a redevelopment environment to a non-redevelopment environment. And sometimes, um, and this is where I do get into state issues, is we don't have a comprehensive plan for things. We just kind of, on a whim, do something without really thinking it through. And what are the full ramifications? And how do we get to the goal that we want to get to um, 
what do we need to do? What steps do we need to take? And I don't think that that was looked at in a comprehensive way to be able to restore the funds needed to the schools and at the local level, but still not um, disrupt the cities like they did. Because even before that, they had raided most of the city's accounts, um, not just the soon, but other cities. So it wasn't very comprehensive, so to speak. And so that's my issue with. It was from their point of view. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> but there wasn't much input, I think, from the city level of what it would do. And, and like I said, I think overall we tend to not do things in a comprehensive way. We kind of look at the short term and do the whims of the short term. We're thinking, what, what does this really mean? How does this impact us five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? I mean, when you get out of high school or college, they make you do that. What's, what's your plan in five? What's your plan in 10? And we really don't hold our politicians to the same standard. Well, what, you know, they just kind of care about the two years of their term or the four years of their when term. When people play politics, the hum, human side goes away. Right. right. So how do you plan to get so soon out of the financial pickle that abruptly ended all redevelopment districts? I think for me is um, definitely going through our budget and looking at what are the expenses, where can we cut in a smart way that are that is going to help still spur long-term growth not just short-term i think recently we just had a five percent um across the board payroll cut and every organization that i've been involved in as as a financial person within the organization whether it's accountant auditor um finance you know across the board cuts usually don't work you usually have to pick something you know and then determine okay we have to let this go and then um, keep this and then go on to the future with that. So for me, I think it's really looking at our budget in a very detailed way, knowing where all the, um, how the intricacies of the budget works together and looking at and determining a comprehensive plan to be able to say, okay, this is what we can cut now. This is what we might have to cut later and, you know, working our way out of the budget that way. I think sometimes, you know, what I hear politicians do is at the top level identify all these things. And they look at it um, at a high level view. But I found working in the budget, you can never do it high level. You have to be in it to be able to make the right decisions, the right cuts, or um, the right shifts, you know, from one fund to another to be able to really effectively change what you need to change in the short term to be able to produce a long term growth. What are your top three chief responsibilities? What are my mm -hmm. currently? Yeah. My life. No, as a, as a city council. Oh, oh, as a, okay. I'm like I'm a mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my the, kids. <laughs> the most important. I'm like a mom, a wife, you know, a good friend. Um, on on our council. Hmm, I've never had it asked to me that way. So, let's see. Uh, I think to ensure that the voices of the citizens are heard. I mean, that's I, I, that. That they that what they say we get and we begin to implement. Um, I have a idea of what I would like to see, but that's just my idea, and I represent one person, Lori. And on the council, you know, I have to look at what is the city as a whole, what do the people want, and then you know, find a way to impact to to get that. Um, put that into practice and if it's impractical or if it's in or if it doesn't make sense have the dialogue that said let me tell you why you don't want to do that and let's figure out a solution to how you can get what you want but in a way that benefits the city as a whole so I think that's the first thing would be to really sh strengthen the voice of my c community I don't think their voice is very strong right now so uh, that leads on to the next how will you connect um, with the people do you you know, being in the council meeting and they just say, oh, well, there's Laurie. Oh, yeah. So our council meetings are in the evening and we're primarily a bedroom community. So most of um, our residents work um, outside of uh, Sassoon and get home pretty late. When they do get home, they have kids, I know, because for a long time, and it still kind of is my life, but for a long time, that was my life. So to go to a council meeting is pretty difficult. Um, when you do go, you normally only get ten, two minutes to speak, which is efficient, because if you had 100 people there speaking for two minutes, you wouldn't get anything done. So I, so I would like to see um, a monthly meeting happening in the community on a Saturday morning, um, once a month at a different place. And having at least two council members represented there because you can't have more than two, you get in other viol acts, um, violations. 
um, where people can come and they know it's an open forum where you can talk and you have a much longer limit because you can't let somebody talk for 40 minutes, you know, but you can have that forum where people can communicate and talk about the issues. And since they're happening in the different neighborhoods, you kind of get the neighborhood there where they're talking about their issue and just involving people that way um, at a time that's more convenient. That's not as formal as a city council meeting, but it's a place where people can feel like they're heard and that you can then be held accountable because you will have to go back to that neighborhood <laughs> and talk to them again. And if you still, and like I said, there's this dialogue. I can't give you, my kids ask me for things all day long. I can't give it to them. You know, that's not impractical, but I have a conversation. I just don't say no and let it go. You know, it's like, okay, well, this is why we can't do this right now, but let's see what we can do, you know, and you have a conversation with them. And so I think we owe it to the people to have that conversation and create an environment where they can, that still follows our rules with, you know, how many council members can be there and things of that sort, but lets people know that their voices are heard because Sassoon is so small, you know, Sassoon only has, I mean, 28,000, a little over 28,000 people. You still can do things like there's no excuse for not doing things like that because you're still at a manageable size where you have five people, excuse me, representing the city. You're still at a manageable size to be able to do that. And because we're landlocked, our population is not going to grow to like a hundred thousand where that's not manageable. I mean, that's something you can put into place and continue um, and keep people included. So is there a pet peeve that you could see yourself being involved in to overturn uh, an issue? Say that there was a bad law put in mm -hmm. that's not working. So is there something there that you can, you've can you already seen and you'd say, okay, we'd like to throw that one out? A bad law. Um, or a law that's missing that you would like to implement. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't think of a law. Um, for me, you know, the issues that I have or my pet peeves are that family issues aren't a priority. You know, that's always been, you know, my pet peeve over the last, you know, four years that I've, three or four years that I've been involved um, in the city more is that we don't have, our, our issues aren't priorities, you know, that, um, you know, when we have a trail that almost loses funding because we didn't make it a priority that would give a safe route to school or, you know, another trail that doesn't have lighting so that, you know, if you're there during the fall, you really can't use it because it's not safe. I mean, just those kind of things, you know, the part of making a city desirable to live in and making people choose to live in that city is um, tending to the needs of families. And I think that's not represented. And that's kind of what my been my part of my biggest, you know, issue is, is that and and when people choose to live in your city and stay, then you have property tax revenue When you have good businesses in your city, you have sales tax revenue. So, you know, having a desirable city to live in um, feeds the economy, you know, of the city and it, and it allows for people to um, just have a better quality of life. And most people, that's just what they want. I mean, they just want a good quality of life where they feel safe, they can go out and they can talk to, I mean, you know, we, that's the things we look for. We look for that ideal. And so, and people will leave a city for that. And I want to make sure people still choose our city and see that, this is where you can have a great quality of life, where you have that sense of community. You, your kids can grow up here, and you feel good to say, I raised my kids in Sassoon, whereas, you know, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have said that. So that's kind of my focus. I can't pinpoint a particular law, but I just think of having the idea that the people of the city, um, that they're the priority and not... Um, focusing on, you know, things that maybe I don't think are, you know, should be that high of a priority or that compete with that. So. Sure. So we'd like to open it up to uh, questions. I get, oh, go ahead. Brian. Well, I'll make it pretty quick because I'm a avid fisherman. I go to Susu every day. Yeah, it's a beautiful place and, uh, and, uh, you used to have a lot of events down there in Susu every Friday night and Sundays too. Now they canceled them. Right. They said they didn't have the financial money to do that no more. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever tried to get ask for volunteers just to come down there and put on events? So here's, now, what does that okay. also do? It also generates revenue for the businesses downtown. Right. Okay, that's one issue. Number two, okay. 
Saturday was a great wine and chocolate festival. Yes. They open the restrooms at 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. At 4.30, they close them. Mm. The event didn't get done until 5 o'clock. Okay. All these people are going home. They have to use the restroom. That's, right. It was already closed. Why can't something be done about that? Mm -hmm. Another one, you got a lot of homeless people in Sioux Soon. Right. That keeps a lot of people out of Old Town Sioux Soon. Mm -hmm. A lot of them. Right. Uh, and uh, what was it? No more events. Well, well let, her, let her chew on those first. Okay. <laughs> well, well the restrooms. I mean, fishermen are there. Yes. Every day from mm -hmm. 6 till dark at night. Yes. They open at 8 and they close at 5 every night. Right. You're talking about the permission? Public the restrooms. The, the public event. restrooms right there. Yeah, the ones that are um, closer to One Harbor Square, right? Those ones are you. All the way down at the end of the marina. Oh, okay. The ones over there that are part of the marina. Exactly. Okay. Those. And then um, people who have, uh, they, those are only open for a certain amount of times. Eight to five. Uh, right. And something can be done about that in the sense of if we have something going on being open longer, and I'm not sure why it would be not, except that maybe the um, marina supervisor wasn't there. And I know that people who do live there, so and not live master. there, the boats have keys to get to be able to use it after. It's because a harbor's master's responsibility. Right. And they do have, um, uh, they've had had an issue. It was open longer at some point, I remember, and there was a lot of issues with vandalism and people doing terrible things to um, the bathroom. And so that is why it's closed earlier. And I think that it makes sense for it to be open when the community is there, you know, during the active times of the community, especially when you have something like the festival. Um, so, I'm, I, so I think that's something that should be looked into, but... I mean, that's probably about the most I can answer to that. That's well, because I, a lot of issues were the homeless people tearing them up. Right. They were really making them And I know up. they've now, they well, not now, they've had it for a while, videotape. You know, have, I have that monitored under video so, surveillance a great deal of time. And they're supposed to be cracking the Sassoon police. They're supposed to be going down there um, when they do see issues. So, and I'm not sure, um, I haven't seen anything come across the police log so I'm not sure if that's a, still a, a major issue of them not coming down there immediately. Okay, the next question. Well, you had the first one was events. Yeah. So, um, Vice Chair of Parks and Recreation Commission. So, we lost the events. Um, redevelopment went away. And um, one way to shore up um, the lack of funds from redevelopment, um, they took from the general fund um, where the events were coming out of. So. Uh, we did lose all of those events, and that's why um, we created the Sassoon City Community Service Foundation to restore all of those events. And I happen to be the president of that foundation, and we restored Fourth of July, and we're working currently on Christmas on the Waterfront. And by next um, summer, we plan to bring back jazz nights. Fam well, we got family movie nights back this, um, this time with a donation from Kiwanis Club. And then also bringing back um, jazz nights and... I'm missing one. Um, Friday night music, live music. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where you have the whole weekend restored. And so there is, it's a group of citizens that got together and said it's unacceptable that we don't have these events, um, that it should be a community thing. It really shouldn't have been a government thing in the first place to host events. And so, you know, when you think about, especially in Sassoon where you're, you know, we keep putting slurry over our roads that erodes um, quite quickly, you know, and we're spending all this money on events. So no one was balking at them losing events in that sense. Um, but we were saying that we really think this is important. And we started with July 4th because if any event you're going to celebrate as a city, it should be Independence Day, you know. And for me, it held a special place in my heart. So in the fall, I came to the council and asked them, um, you know, what we were doing about that. I wanted to see something happen. Um, they decided to come up with the ad hoc committee. And I was on that committee, and out of that, I came up with the idea that, it sh that well, first we were having difficulty raising money because nobody wanted to give money to the city to put on an event. And so I came up with the idea to have a separate foundation that would be ran just by commu people in the community. And so we, in February 4th, we created um, Sassoon City Community Services Foundation, and it's made up of a group of citizens. Um, and we uh, raised funds, and we raised over $48,000 um, to save the fireworks, and we did. And we were happy about that, and we're on a track to raise, um, uh, what is it, $18,000 to save Christmas on the waterfront. So by next year, we'll do it, because what we do is we ask people. We tell people, give $20 a family, 
I mean, you can't get cheaper. You can't go anywhere and get any entertainment for 20 bucks a family. We had quite a few families do that. I mean, it was definitely a community effort. And um, those are the kind of things I like to see where it's the residents, if we really want a, a community events, that we come up and say, hey, let's do the community events. And that was all volunteers that did that. So it was really um, a wonderful thing to see. And it definitely brought the city closer. And we have community events happening um, at the new Croc Center where people can come and give input about what they want to see next year beyond the um, weekend events and the two major events. And so we're looking for ways to partner with the rest of our community and other nonprofits to be able to have this in um, so soon. Because our foundation is about community service building projects that create a quality of life for people in Sassoon. And I think that goes with the overall narrative of people will choose to soon if their um, quality of life is increased, if they can go fishing, you know what I mean, and have a good time and go to a good art, wine, and chocolate festival. That'll help. Brian. Most cities have the ability to expand in order to stimulate economic growth. So soon right. is landlocked, so that yes. is kind of off the table. What ideas do you have to uh, stimulate economic growth within Sassoon? Well, first, we have quite a bit of buildings in Sassoon. Um, that are completely vacant <laughs> and um, we need to fill those places like 333 Sunset is a, a large office building that the type of people that would um, rent that space would bring in much better jobs and so we want to um, you know that's part of what I want to do is make sure that we're aggressively soliciting businesses to say there is space in Sassoon we have the same thing at One Harbor Square so making sure that we're bringing in businesses to fill the current commercial place that we do have we have quite a bit if you go to our downtown area we have quite a bit of vacant um, buildings um, we have and the downtown is a great place to eat and a great place to get your hair done but beyond that <laughs> There's not much more to do. I mean, you know, we have, no, we have Dimitri's. It's a great place to, you know, lounge and listen to some great music. But we need shops there. We need, you know, women like to shop. So we need a place where we can go get those pair earrings that we can't find anywhere else. Like if we're at the other marinas and other cities, you know, where you can get those types of things. So we need to bring in more shops. And then we do have current um, land that is undeveloped. And we need to develop the land that we do have in a smart type of way. Um, I've just retired from a business and part of my problem was we never had any staff, any council members come and talk to us as business people and say, what can we do for you? How can we serve you? And that seems to be missing. Yes. It's like, let's, we'll play politics with your life and we don't care about your business. Oh, you don't like it? Move. Right. And that's the general attitude that we have. Right. And I think that, um, you know, I don't agree with that kind of approach. I think that as a, a council member, um, you represent the voices of the citizens that live there. And you also um, need to speak to the businesses that um, contribute there. They're a vested interest. They have a vested interest in the success of Sassoon because it causes their business to be successful. So I think there needs to be that constant dialogue with them, especially before, you know, sometimes people talk about raising rates, raising fees and things of that sort. We'll talk to the businesses and talk about well, what does that mean to you? How will that impact you? What is your current bottom line? You know what? Before you just go and say, OK, we need more money. Let's raise this fee, that kind of thing. So I think that there needs to be a partnership um, with the businesses in the area because they have a vested interest in the city. And, and, they're, um, and I don't like to say their voice be heard. I don't look at them as citizens of the city, like, you know, like the person who bought the house there. But I do look at them as partners with the city, that they are there saying, okay, there's, I want to offer a service, whatever it is, whether it's a good, you know, or a service to the residents of Sassoon. And um, I want to be viable here. So how do I help? make that relationship great that you have with the people who I am really repre representing. And so, um, like I said, I don't think we necessarily represent the businesses, but it's important to have that partnership with the businesses because they're there for a reason and I want to make sure they do well there. Because if, if businesses do well in my city, my city does well. I mean, the people of my city, like I said, you know, right now people leave my city to go get, you know, school supplies. You know, I'd like a business there who is going to do uh, bring that type of service to um, my to the people of my city. And so I want to make sure that they're good. Now, that doesn't mean I throw the baby out. I mean, you know, just completely give in to every whim they want. But it's like, what is the best relationship that we can have um, so that we can both meet the needs of the people who live here? Bill. 
This is a two-part question. Okay. What specifically are your top two or three long-term goals for Sassoon? And what would you specifically do to affect those? So I think um, long-term would definitely be bringing in additional revenue to the city through businesses filling in our commercial areas and then using undeveloped land um, and making sure that we have the policies in place and um, basically the policies in place to be able to facilitate that because um, I think that's a priority for Sassoon. We have um, quite a bit of housing and we have quite a bit of vacant housing if someone wanted to live there so I don't think that we need additional traditional housing. I think we do need, um, which would be my second party, we, need, we do need um, senior housing in our city. We don't have sufficient for the, the um, land that, I mean, for the number of people that we do have, we don't have sufficient housing for seniors. And so I think we need additional housing. But the first would be um, businesses, you know, bringing in the businesses that will increase revenue to the city, bring up property tax value, bring in sales tax revenue. Um, and the second would be probably uh, would be our senior housing and the third would be we need a vested interest in our police department. I think one of the biggest issues is I don't think we have enough police for the number of city, uh, um, the number of people, people, <laughs> I'm losing our citizens population that we have and making sure that we're um, properly vested in our police department to be able to um, keep crime low in Sassoon. And those are basically by my three. And the first one with business is aggressively targeting, making sure our policies in place that would attract new businesses and making sure that we have, um, sometimes you just need to change the ambassador. You know, I think the city council is an ambassador um, for the city. And um, we've had council members who've been there quite some time. And, and um, sometimes people are like, oh, I don't want to work with that person anymore. I don't want to do this. And when you have that, because we don't, unlike other cities in Solano County um, who have a nice turnover, of, of the people who represent the city. We haven't quite had that in Sassoon. So I think changing the ambassador will help um, quite, or not all the ambassadors, but injecting a new ambassador will help in that regard. And um, one that can speak to, you know, diverse issues. And then also making sure that we are, um, you know, taking care of our seniors. Um, you know, people look at my age and they think, oh, I don't care about seniors, but you know, that's a big deal for my age group because we have parents, you know, I have, um, a, a mother-in-law who just, uh, you know, went through um, cancer. I have a mother who has MS. At some point, you know, I might have to take care of them. And it might not be, um, well, both of them are really independent, so I don't know if they want to live in my house. But <laughs> there's, not, there's not another place for them to say, okay, well, come move closer to me so that we can help. You know, there's not adequate um, senior housing. So I think um, we need that in Sassoon. And so making sure that, you know, we're going after that. And like I said, with the police is if you bring in additional revenue, then you can support the police department and make sure that we have adequate police. Because there's certain essential things that we have to supply as a city. I mean, and sometimes we get off in different things like with events and stuff of like that. But, you know, police safety is, is one of those things that we've said that we need to all contribute to and be distributed out, you know, for public good. So that's a big thing for me. And Dave, um, I've heard people talk about the DA's office as being somewhat weak on crime, and I guess the end result is that you see the same exact criminals back on the street, and the officers are arresting them over and over again. Are you looking at being a force of the city council to bring that to the DA's office and to, you know, basically start holding these criminals accountable to keep them off the street for a period of time that, you know, where justice would be served? I, and in some ways, I think the city council's um, role is to be vocal about the needs of their community. And so if you're seeing um, that the crimes that are happening in your area are um, not being prosecuted, then they need to say something. And if you keep seeing people being returned to the city and you see that continual, you know, revolving door, with the same individual, there needs to be, it needs to be vocal. And a lot of times um, when you are struggling budget wise, which I know our county is, um, you may seek more to do deals or um, I don't want to say cut corners, but you know, you might not be aggressive. You might prosecute and spend your resources only on the ones that you think are going to be able to um, actually get someone, you know, in jail. But I think that, uh, what am I trying to say? I think that if you're vocal, sometimes the squeaky will, you know, 
gets the oil. So I think if you're a city council that they know <laughs> that you're going to be vocal about the issues of your city, that they're going to be at, more apt to pay attention to you. And that's just, you know, how I would hope that that would work. And you could be squeaky? Well, my husband walked in. You can ask him. <laughs> I definitely could be squeaky. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. Like I talked about before is I follow my passion. And so um, with passion comes energy. And so I feel like if I'm not meeting the needs of um, my residents, then why am I there? You know, so if my re if I continually see crime in my area and I continually see the same offenders, then there's an issue there and we, it needs to be taken care of. And so it has to be where it's brought up what is happening because we keep seeing the same thing happen. And, and sometimes we just allow, I mean, some, some of the things that happen to us in life or happen to us as a city is because we've allowed it to. And so it's one of those things that where you have to be active. If you're going to be on the council, then you need to be active because you've been put there to be active because that person can't be active. They're working or they're taking care of their family. So they're saying, hey, you go and, and speak on my behalf. And so if you're on the council and you're not doing that, then, you know, why are you there? Matt. I'm sure you're aware that uh, <clears throat> as a council person, you will also uh, wear the hat of a sewer district right. board member. So it's a two-part thing. Well, okay. that's the first part. The second part is how do you balance the, uh, the representative portion of your job as a councilwoman and the protecting the interests of the sewer district portion of being a sewer board member? How do you balance that? Hmm. How would you balance that? Right. I, I think just being informed, um, doing your homework. I think, um, I don't think they're in conflict, so to speak, with one another because part of, um, yeah, I don't see them as a conflicting. I think that if, whatever you do, you make sure you're informed, that you don't do it in a vacuum, that you actually read the material before you, you inspect it, you ask the questions that you need to ask, and you base your decision based on that, that, um, that you base your decisions on, the, on that information, on what you feel like you've gathered, and make the best decision possible um, you know, for your people and for the, the two areas, you know, Fairfield and Sassoon, that district as a whole. I don't see them in conflict. So. Well, the only reason I ask is because recently uh, I attended a sewer district meeting and there was uh, the issue of a rate hike came up mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, eight out of ten are for it. And, you know, how, how, as a council person, even if you're against it, how do you, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you go against a rate increase and then go back and tell your concern? How do you vote for a rate increase and then go back and tell your constituents that it's good for them? I think before you vote for it, you're already having that conversation with the people about it. I mean, that's, yeah, you know, this whole, we don't make these decisions in a vacuum, and we shouldn't. And it shouldn't be that I decide um, that I make that vote without talking to people. I think that's where the dialogue happens, where you're talking to the people and saying, okay, this is what's happening with the sewer rates or with the water rate. This is what's going on, and this is what we think we need to do. And you're assessing it as a whole, and you're having that conversation beforehand. And I know you can't say, oh, I'm going to say yes or say no, but you can have the conversation, and you can listen to all the people who will be impacted by it and decide whether that's really the best thing at this time. Or And then you have to look at, what are the costs um, as far as why you need the rate hike? If it's justified, then you communicate it's justified. This is what's going on. This is why, you know, and you get um, the people to say, okay, I understand that. I understand why you have to give me a 12 cent raise or a 27 cent, or, uh, you know, raise and fee hike. I think you have to have those conversations. And as long as you're having those conversations, then um, I think you're okay and there's not conflict there. I think the problem is, is people feel like they're not heard. And if you just listen to them, even if you disagree, like we were going over the um, Measure L, the library tax, which I thought was important, you know, uh, and I thought it was a tax that we needed to continue. I remember being a kid, um, you know, growing up poor and literally library was daycare. You know, my mom would work and she after school, we go to the library until she got off work and we'd read books and, you know, all that. And I live behind the library. My daughter goes there, you know, and loves it. And so. I really like the library tax and I would knock on people's doors because I was advocating for it and 
They didn't like the tax because it was tax, and they were, you know. And as we talked about how much it was, what would it do for our city? What would happen if it wasn't? When people understood, they were like, oh, "Okay, well, that's that's all right. I'm for the library," you know. So it's those kind of things. Taxes aren't always bad because there's reasons for taxes as long as they're being used for what you intended to them. If I'm going to give you my penny. Um, I want to make sure it's being used effectively, and I want to make sure it's being used for what I intended it to be used for, and that you're being a good steward of that penny. Then I'm okay with paying that penny. So that's really what it's. I think taxes. You know, I don't think they're inherently evil. I think what you do with it、um, could be terrible. So what are you doing with it?、And、I think with rate hikes, the same thing. Yeah, if if it really costs that much more to To, to provide this service, then that's one thing. But if it costs that much more because you're not using your resources wisely, no, we're not going to pay for that, and I don't want to pay for that.、Yeah. So I think it just matters. You mentioned your efforts to、uh, raise private capital and、uh, community volunteers to restore the various festivals, which I definitely give you kudos for. <laughs> Thank you. Can that model of private foundations and community volunteerism be used to shore up other? Deficiencies in services offered by Susu Municipal Government, you know, along the lines of say picking up trash at the park or helping out the police department do minor tasks, things like that. Right, being involved, I definitely think so. I think how do you,、um, like for instance, the police department. You know, a lot of police departments, especially in the larger cities, have a type of a cadet program where it's a volunteer program, where you know your youth can get involved. They can see what it means to be involved in the police force, possibly use it as a future career. Excuse me, if nothing else, just training and discipline. So I think that would be.、Um, I think that's a. I think you can use that model for so many things. I think we depend heavily. On our government for a lot of things that、um, they necessarily shouldn't do,、um, and not that I'm saying you know shouldn't have social programs and things like that. I always say,、um, you know, California. As a kid, I grew up poor,、um, very poor, and California made an investment in me as a kid, and now they're getting a return on their investment. You know, because I have a good-paying job, I pay my taxes, I contribute to society. I'm glad that they were there when、um, I didn't have and didn't necessarily have.、Um, uh, I won't go far to say that,、uh, but anyway, I didn't have <laughs> as a kid, and thank God for social programs. You know, I wouldn't be sitting here today.、Um, so I think there's a, you know, there's there's a need for government to do some things, but I think we rely quite a bit heavily on them, and there are ways to do it privately. And I think there needs to be this relationship, kind of like a symbiotic relationship, where you you figure out a way to.、Um, Have government help spur it in a sense? Like in our community, that came out the ad hoc, the foundation came out of an ad hoc meeting that was put on by the government. Let's talk about、um, the issues of Fourth、uh, of July and the events and how do we save them? And through that meeting, is when I was like, okay, we can't do this unless we have a foundation. So we got to get outside of the government to do this to make this effective. But that came out of a, you know, a. "Quote unquote government meeting." So I think there's just this relationship that has to happen where they're both communicating with one another. Last question. Okay, I、um, I've been in Susun. Before I ask the question, which side of Susun do you live on? The old town or the new town? Not. Well, I live. You know, Pintel. Yes, in that community where I live behind Susun Elementary. Okay,、there. do you walk the marina quite a bit with your、yes. family? Okay. Yes. Well, yes. You, in the last ten years, have you noticed a decrease in people walking down there now? Yes. Okay,、uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with cleaning up the city because there's、uh, people are scared of the homeless people now. Right. They, they've mentioned that to us quite a bit because、yes. we go down there a lot. Do you think there's either a win-win solution down there? For the homeless, for the issue homeless to bring, people, yeah,、um, it's hard because you know I always say California homeless have have it best. They got agreeable weather. <laughs> I mean, they don't, and that's why we have so many in California compared to other harsher places.、Um, and it's hard because that's a beautiful area where you can just hang out, plenty of shade. You know, I mean, if you if you're going to be homeless and you have some, you have to be somewhere during the day. That's kind of the place to be.、Um, I think there. That's where what we were talking about before private foundations. I think it would help in Sassoon if we had something that can help with the homeless, like the mission does for Solano County as a whole. Maybe having partnering with them to have a satellite place downtown where there is a place for them to go and talking to them about you know being good citizens and good neighbors. You know,、um, I remember being homeless as a kid, and I don't remember being.、Um, 
as violent as you know some of the Sassoon homeless people are down there and theirs is more related to a drug problem so it's more of make sure that the people there get the resources that they need so that they because being homeless is not a bad thing I mean you know it's not an ideal thing but just because they're homeless doesn't make them bad but um, you know the ones that are related to drug issues you know making sure they get the resources they need like using nonprofit Mission Solano and them partnering with the city to bring in a satellite um, uh, program to Sassoon, particularly at the marina area, might help because then you have people, you know, directly giving them resources there. And that's not something that comes out of city budget, you know, but sometimes um, you can collaborate with nonprofits by just highlighting what they're due and, you know, bringing them in and saying, hey, we want you to work. We have a common goal here. We have a homeless issue and you care about the homeless. So come work here and do um, your work here. We got. We've got a rebellion here. Okay. <laughs> One more question. Thank you. You mentioned you ran two years ago. Yes. How has the municipal climate changed in the last two years? But more importantly, how have you changed in the last two years since your last campaign? Um, the climate has changed in a sense that our budget has gotten much um, worse. You know, with the budget deficit, our shortfall has definitely increased and um, there hasn't been much um, progressive change. You know, we've been kind of just as stagnant as we were before. So I feel like two years we haven't gained anything and we've lost um, more money. Uh, so in that regard, that's, you know, at that level. Um, for me, I think, um, you know, we're different tomorrow than we were yesterday. So I'm definitely, progress as far as you know as a human being and a person I think what's different for me this time around than running last time around is I'm more confident about my ability to influence um, change in my city I'm much more sold on it myself than I was the first time the first time I knew because I just know me that I can make a difference this time I absolutely without a doubt know that I can make a difference and that my voice needs to be on that council and that I will run until that happens or somebody comes along with a similar passion as me and gets in you know but I think that um, there's just that underrepresentation of families there that's the underrepresentation of you know um, fiscal accountability because um, we need that at our government levels they're using you know our our money so to speak and we need to make sure they're using it um, the, the appropriate way. So for me, that's, you know, that's a big deal. And I'm more confident in my ability to be able to express that than I was the first time around. Well, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is that what the government is doing? What do we stand for? What are we hanging out here for? And yet we're so why do you come here? Sort of this that somebody was gonna cut in half for me or three quarters of it, and I'm not gonna give it to them. Well, communist sympathizer, I could come down here. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome here. Wait on these things because they don't have politics. Because what's gonna affect me? The uncertainty. 